Hi everybody, welcome back to Dave's Math Channel. Um, this is my next video on my series on the Math Lovers book. I'm up to section 2.6 of uh, volume 1. That's the volume shown on the left of this slide I'm talking about. I've um, been talking about uh, Pythagorean theorem and uh, um, from Oz last theorem. The last two videos I did were on Pythagorean theorem and Pythagorean triples which are triples of integers a, b, and c, such that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I usually satisfy Pythagorean theorem. Uh, today I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, but kind of related, for Maslow's theorem. And it's going to be a pretty brief uh, lecture. So anyway, let's begin. So I, I just have to say what for Maslow's theorem uh, says. And um, uh, there was a French mathematician named Pierre de Fermat. He lived in the 17th century. He was actually considered one of the greatest number theorists of his day. Um, he came up with some pretty amazing uh, number theory results. I think I mentioned him a few weeks ago when I was talking about Fermat primes. He discovered Fermat primes, among other things. But he came up with this result, which he thought he proved. And he even has a note. And I'm going to try to read this. Uh, can't read without my glasses. So he said, it's impossible for a cube to be the sum of two cubes, a fourth power to be the sum of two fourth powers, or in general, for any number uh, that is a power greater than uh, the second to be the sum of two like powers. I have discovered a truly marvelous demonstration of this proposition that uh, this margin is too narrow to contain. He wrote this in one of his notebooks back in 16... Um, I think it was 1637, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but he never provided a proof. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was it was one of the most frustrating results uh, in the whole history of mathematics. Uh, I think most mathematicians, since he wrote this down, thought he had actually proved it. So in other words, what it really says is, you know, I was talking about uh, Pythagorean triples, which are just triples of integers A, B, C, so that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And I mentioned yesterday that there's infinitely many such triples of integers. But what Fermat claimed, that if the power is greater than 2, for instance, a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed, or a to the 4th plus b to the 4th equals c to the 4th, or a to the 5th plus b equals 5th equals c to the 5th, any, any integer, any exponent, n, such so as a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n, if n is greater than 2, he claimed that there's no solutions for integers a, b, c, as long as that exponent n is fixed. And he said he had a proof, but he said he didn't have enough right to, room to write it down. He never actually did write down a proof. He proved it for a few special cases. I think he proved it when n equals 3 and n equals 4. It's actually not that hard to prove when n equals 4. I've done this proof. n equals 3 is trickier. But uh, he, didn't, he didn't come up. I mean, I think, I think the consensus now is that I think just about every mathematician in the world believes that he never actually did come up with a proof. Maybe he thought he did. He probably thought he had a proof for all n, but I'm sure that it had a flaw in it. And the reason I think this, and the reason most mathematicians think this, is because this was a this was an unsolved math problem uh, for, for over 350 years, from 1637 until finally Andrew Wiles, who was a Princeton mathematician, or Cambridge mathematician, named Andrew Wiles from Cambridge, England, uh, who, who came up with a very, very complicated proof, 129-page proof involving uh, some of the most complicated math anybody's ever studied, more complicated than I've ever even been able to study, algebraic geometry. It was a 129-page proof that involved some cutting-edge math that wasn't even invented until the 20th century, until 300 years after Fermat. Uh, and he spent about, I don't know how long uh, on this proof, at least a couple of years. He, his first proof was flawed. He had to, he had to uh, write another uh, paper. He had to fix his first paper because he found an error in his first proof, but he fixed it. And then he finally proved it in 1995. And so far, nobody's found any flaws in his proof. It's a very difficult proof to go through. I've never gone through it. You know, I don't think I could even. But, you know, a handful of mathematicians have. And all the mathematicians who have studied Andrew Wiles' proof, I think, are convinced that it holds water, that it is an actual proof of Fermat's last theorem. But it took over 350 years to prove. 
And uh, just to give you an idea, I'm going to give you a little bit more history on this problem because I think it's a really interesting problem. So like I said, some special cases were, were, uh, um, um, were proven. Uh, I think Fermat himself proved n equals 3, n equals 4. Uh, and then uh, there were other mathematicians who proved it for some other small exponents. I actually have another video on this, which I made a few months ago. You might want to watch that one uh, from Ma's last theorem. I have a table of all the exponents for which for which Fermat's last theorem was proved. And the number of exponents grew. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I can tell you a few milestones uh, before I tell you to do that. I mean, there was, there was an there was an 18th century mathematician, I think a pretty famous one. I don't know who it was. It might have been Lagrange or Laprosse. I think it was a French mathematician who, uh, he was a teacher. I guess he was a professor. And he had a lot of students who had claimed that they could prove it for Ma's last theorem. But he went through, uh, you know, several proofs. He found they were all flawed. Finally, he asked one of his students, he made a special stamp, which he gave to one of his students. He said, there is an error on, on page blank, line blank of your proof of Fermat's last theorem. And he asked his student to, to go through every proof he was given and, and fill in the blanks, say where the error was. And I think he was able to do it with every, every paper he was ever given. So, so there were all these flawed proofs of Fermat's last theorem, hundreds of them. But there was progress on this problem. It was slow. I think by the mid 19th century, there was a mathematician named, uh, what was his name? I can't remember. Uh, Dirichlet, I think. It was, it was one of those uh, number theorists. I can't remember who right now. But he proved it for special types of, it turns out you only have to prove it for prime exponents. If you can prove it for prime exponents as well as n equals four, then it follows for all other exponents. So, so it was known, I think that there was a guy who proved it for what are called regular primes. I can't remember offhand who this mathematician was. He proved this in the mid 19th century. And uh, he thought that all primes were regular. It turns out not all primes are regular. I think 37 is the smallest irregular prime. Actually, it turns out most primes are irregular <laughs> the way we're defined. So, so then they had to prove it for irregular primes, and progress was really slow on that. And finally, I think by around 1992, just a couple of years before Andrew Wiles actually proved it for all exponents, it was known already for all exponents of something like 2 million. So it was virtually known. I think just about every mathematician in the world believed that Fermat's last theorem was true. They just didn't know how to prove it. But finally, Andrew Wiles did, which I think was a really remarkable uh, achievement. And I just want to say one more thing. I mean, I was, I was a graduate student at, uh, at you know, UC Berkeley when uh, Andrew Wiles uh, proved Fermat's last theorem. I remember it. It made, a, it made a lot of big news among the mathematical circles, you know. But what, what really appalled me at the time was that this was 1995, and I don't know how many guys remember the O.J. Simpson trial. I don't know how many guys remember when O.J. Simpson was accused of the double murder. Uh, supposedly, he murdered his, uh, his wife and his wife's lover. He stabbed them both with a knife, and then there was this big Bronco chase where he ran off in his Bronco and was trying to run for the police, and uh, I think he even threatened suicide before all this happened. And then there was a big trial that lasted a couple of years, and they found him not guilty. And uh, this is the same year that Andrew Wiles proved for Ma's last year. I just remember how appalled I was, because I even heard it on the radio. I heard the jury announcement on the radio. O.J. Simpson was found not guilty by the, by the L.A. jury. Uh, you know, which I think was a biased jury. Uh, I mean, everybody knew he was guilty. It just all the evidence pointed uh, that he was. Uh, but I was so appalled because the whole world knew who O.J. Simpson was. I mean, he was a famous football player. I'll grant you that. He was a famous quarterback for, for you know, many years. And he became a big celebrity afterwards. He was in a lot of movies. He was in the Naked Gun movies. He was very funny in them, you know. Uh, he was on some other good movies, too. Uh, Koopman Capricorn 1, which I think is a really excellent movie. Uh, so a lot of people really loved him. You know, he was a very entertaining celebrity. But what really appalled me was that I, was, I thought it was clear as day that he was guilty of this double murder. And yet the whole world knew who he was. He was a big celebrity, and because he was so famous, 
he got off, uh, you know, which I think was the wrong, um, you know, the wrong judgment, not guilty. I think it's clear to me he was guilty as hell. But but everybody in the world knew who he was. You know, he was a multimillionaire. He got away with murder. And nobody knew, practically nobody in the world knew who Andrew Wiles was. And he proved a, a result that was unknown for 350 years. He was probably, he's probably the, he's still alive, by the way. And he's probably the most famous living mathematician in the world right now. And I still think it's a very small minority of people who know who he is. So to me, that just says there's something wrong with our priorities of who we who we think is famous in our society. I hope you guys don't think I'm lecturing too much, but you know, I just think it's pretty appalling that we, you know, and uh, you know, I know that you know, yeah, O.J. Simpson did get away with supposedly murder, and maybe I'm not allowed to say that he really committed the murder because. He did get off. The jury did find him not guilty. And, you know, maybe I'm just voicing my opinions, which may not even be true. Maybe I'm not even allowed to say that. But I, I'm just telling you how I felt when this was going on, you know. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of problems with our society. This is just one of them. And I also think that uh, mathematicians and intellectuals in general aren't anywhere nearly enough well-revered, especially here in America. Well, we could give a shit about education and, and intellectual activity, you know. We'd rather see people, uh, you know, um, running a ball, uh, you know, pigskin across a field or, or bouncing a ball across a court or uh, beating each other up in a, in a, you know, uh, uh, in a boxing match. But enough preaching about all that. Anyway, that, that, that completes my video for today. Um, thank you for watching. Long live math, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.